For those of you who don't know, I literally slid into Haley's DMs. <laughs> I was going to say that. I did. You did slide in my DMs. This is the thing. I don't, I haven't slid, slid into many people's DMs. And that was just at the beginning when everything was like super new. You're you the did. only one that I've kept in contact with. We were fun. Feel better. I was like, oh, but, okay. So like people, people do a slide. They, they slip and they slide in there. And, um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm weird. I don't even remember what you said, but I was like, oh, she seems cool. Welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators and where we share our stories on all things queer related. My name is Brie Walker, Brie Logan on all platforms. And if you're listening to this and you're not subscribed, what you doing, baby? Hit that subscribe button. Um, our guest on this episode is a musical comedy improv actor and singer. She's a quarantine longboarder and a TikTok creator. Um, you can find her on at Haley Presley Miller on TikTok and Instagram. So please welcome Haley Presley Miller. So I do want to start off with this. W like, what's this duckling obsession thing about on Instagram? I need to know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So um, one of the friends I made in the city, I live in Chicago. We we're in a comedy class together at Second City, and we bonded over this Instagram account called Small Animals, spelled S-O-M-L, and how they were all like small or very like, or no, 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 and chonky animals instead of chunky, it's chonky. Anyways, um, so recently during quarantine, she started like just posting different cute animals to her story, and I found this, which was like, I think it's like ducklings of the day or something, daily ducklings, I don't know, but... During this time, I've just found that cute animals bring me joy, and I just wanted to share that with my friends and people that watch my story. So every so often, if like it, if I see one that I love and it feels like a day where people might need something happy to look at, I post a picture of a cute duckling. That's amazing. That's so funny because I had had that experience with the ducklings in the yes. pond. Yes. And for those of you who aren't following me on Instagram, you might not have seen my story, but we had ducklings in my parents' pond. There was like 12 of them and the mom was trying to get them all out. And I posted this entire story because I had the, the lawn care guy literally like videoing me trying to get it them so out because I thought it was going to be really good content and super funny. And it was, I guess. Um, and so she started posting duckling stuff and I was like, oh my God. You miss your babies. Yeah, I did. I did. And one of them got back in the pool the other day or then like the next day. So we like had to get that one out. And people were so concerned. They were coming out in droves. They were like, where did the mom go? Where are you going to put the ducklings? Did you call animal control? Like all of this stuff. Do you have a shelter for them? And I was like, dude, like I'm now I feel like I have to do Everyone something. Everyone cared. <laughs> yeah, they really went hard, and I was like, we have them in a secure place, like, there's the lake nearby, like, don't worry. <laughs> It'll be okay. Uh, it was really funny. So, you got on TikTok, and you realized that it wasn't just for kids, and you made a video about being an old gay on the app, and the video and the sound went completely viral. Tell me about that. So, I actually, okay, I originally downloaded TikTok um, about a week before quarantine, which was perfect timing, honestly. Um, and the first TikToks I saw actually were um, video like clips on my Instagram discover page, which is normally pretty much filled with just like theater, gay stuff, and cute animals, I guess. Um, <laughs> and I saw a few TikToks and I was like, what is this? Uh, I thought this was for kids. Did they dance? But they were so, but it was like all just like a big like group of queer people. So I downloaded TikTok and I did find that I am not old. People get really mad in my comments. They're like, you're 25, you're not old. And I'm like, yes, I know in essence, I am not old. But as far as TikTok goes, I feel quite old. Okay, I had to Google simp. Okay. I, I did too. I, I did too. I had to make a video about those like like a uh, fairy sparkle emojis because mm -hmm. I was like, we're being mean, but we're being not I didn't understand. Um, so anyways, I got really into it in like the span of a week and I just I just wanted to talk about it. And that's that's where that came from. And it 
it like weirdly took off. It was like mm-hmm. one of my first actual videos I recorded for TikTok. Um, and yeah, that was weird to see, but it's been super cool when, you know, I'll be scrolling and I'll hear my voice and it's very weird, but I'm not looking at myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but every single one that I find, I always try and like comment and be like, thank you for using my sound because um, I feel like people can be kind of territorial about stuff on TikTok, about like yeah. themes and things they do, but it's literally set up to use people's sounds, to copy trends, to, to like use different formats that other people come up with. So I love, I love seeing people use it. So. Yeah, it, it is one of those apps where you're constantly sharing stuff. And so when people use your sound, like you can tell who it came from because you can just click the sound. So mm-hmm. like, I always kind of thought like, do I need to tag them in my description? I'm like, wait, well, they can, they're literally like all of the videos are underneath that sound. So I don't, and it's one of those things on TikTok where I was trying to figure out like, okay, is this just a regular trend that I'm like copying? So I don't need to tag, or is this something where I'm specifically copying that person? So then I need to say like inspo by, and I had made some mistakes with it. There was one video that I made that like, I should have like tag the person and I honestly forgot who whose it was I just had the idea from them like Mm -hmm. like a couple days ago and somebody commented and was like this is copy this is from so and so and I was like thank you so much because I I'm glad you tagged them Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah yeah. if I see it once and I know like they're the only one that did it then I'll definitely try and remember to tag but I mean you're putting it out there you don't own necessarily any of it and TikTok is all about trends so it is. It's constantly trending content. And I try to make stuff that is straight and I try to make it gay. And I try to be the first one to make it gay. I'm not as big and I was like really into it when I first started, like back right before or right after uh, uh, Easter. And I was like all up in the page, like how can I create it, this for this community? And now I'm kind of chill about it. Like I only like make what I make. But, uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's super fun to take something like a straight trend and to make it gay because that's when like people like like flock to it. Yes, that's when our community freaks out. Of oh course. yeah, of course. Especially your video with your grandpa where like he wanted a grandson, but mm-hmm. he got the fish. It's perfect. Yeah, those like straight people love those, which is hilarious. Like obviously, gay people love them, but like they've crossed over into straight TikTok, and I know this because I get like hate and crazy shit on them and those are the only videos I get crazy shit because it's in straight TikTok like swear to god I once was scrolling on my roommate so my I have a roommate and um she's straight and uh, I was scrolling I was like I kept hearing people talk about straight TikTok so I grabbed her phone one day and I was like can I just look at this (laughs) I have a reaction video somewhere myself and I'm scrolling and the whole time I'm just like like a little like it's just it's a lot I was a little disgusted at what I saw (laughs) Oh no. <laughs> there were just so many things where it was like the quintessential family. And I was like, oh, why are these stereotypes still just being so pushed into oh, it was so much, but it was it was really funny to see. And to see um all of those e-boy thirst traps that happened. Oh yes. Okay, so another thing you've been very outspoken about um is also being a femme lesbian. So what has your experience been like? coming out and wanting to, you know, dress and present girly, because I know that you've talked a lot about it and you've made videos about it on TikTok and you've also talked about it on Instagram. So tell me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, So I didn't really figure out I liked women until I was like 21, 22. Um, And that was big for me. It was right at the tail end of college. Um, And I moved to Chicago a week after graduation and I moved to Boys Town which is like the queer neighborhood in Chicago Mm -hmm. and I immediately dove right in but I also started to change the way I dress now I'm very known amongst my friends and growing up like I love pink I love sparkles it's annoying but I love it um (laughs) it's a lot um very girly take forever to get ready but um, I started to dress differently. I started, you know, I thought that I had to dress a certain way to fit in and to be seen. And that's a big theme all over gay TikTok right now, um, for sure. But it took some time for me to try it and then feel that it really wasn't right for me. 
to then kind of go back to my femme ways. And while now I see a lot of femme representation more and more, I, I didn't a few months ago when I first joined TikTok, or at least when I was only seeing like the big lesbian quick TikTok creators. Um, so I wanted to be kind of a voice for that. I hope to talk about it more. I would love to facilitate more conversations in that way in my comments and kind of get down to a more real way of talking to my followers and things like that. I think too right now with everything that's going on, I am, <clears throat> it's hard for me to feel inspired to make videos for mm -hmm. sure just the life and what's going on but i also feel kind of fake sometimes being forced into a trend like sometimes i feel like i need to also do this like i need mm -hmm. to do the look at me i put a face on wow and i yeah. it. Like, everyone's doing it do i need to do it no if i'm not inspired right now i'm sorry but uh yeah so long-winded answer but i i hope to talk about that more on my on my TikTok because I do speak about it on my Instagram. Um, but I, I just think it's a conversation that needs to be had for sure. Completely. Yeah. I agree with what you were talking about with feeling pulled to, to make certain content when you don't really want to, but like not wanting to miss an opportunity for trending content that could garner views and garner followers. Cause like I felt the same way and I had to really think like, I mean, cause you have like a certain brand and I, and whether people want to like, like it or not, like if you're making videos, like you have a specific brand, whatever that is, if it's manufactured or if you're being yourself. And I really had to think like, is this me? Is this trend me? Like the dancing is not me. I, I did it like once and it was like ironic. And I was like, okay, I don't even like it ironically. Cause it's not even good. Like it'd be funny if it was like good and ironic, but it's not. So it's, that's not me. Like thirst traps aren't me. Like I tried to do something that was a little bit like that, but not really. And I was just like, you know what? Like you got to figure out what works for you and what works for like how, how you want to present yourself on a platform. And like, I, I'll watch things. And even if they were not trending now, if they had trended before, like I still do them because I have a lot of fun doing them. But if mm -hmm. I can find something that's trending right now, that like, is I don't want to say on brand, but it feels like something I want to do, and like I can authentically express my personality and myself in it. Then I'm going to do it because I feel good when I post it, and it usually garners more people. Because like if you're being consistent, you know, if you're being consistent with how you present yourself, those followers are going to always consistently know like types of content that you're going to post and the types of people. So like I definitely have felt that pull, and it sucks, and it's hard to like navigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've definitely branded myself as, you know, I fit in the niche of femme lesbian. Like, yeah. that is me. I, that is one part of me. So, so okay. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> like, TikTok wise, like, that's all of me on there, even if it's not all of me in real life. But um, yeah, I think it's also the pull of I never went into it wanting to gain a ton of followers and be a famous. I mean, like, be a super famous TikTok lesbian, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it just kind of took off a little. And I have my days sometimes where I see, you know, like people with a big following and I'm like, I want that. I, and, and, then, and then it comes down to it. And like yesterday I was making videos and half of them, I was like, these aren't that great. Like, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. the vibes, you can tell that I'm just trying really hard and that's not what yeah. I want to do. I'd rather, I'd rather put up something of value even if it's just like something silly, it's still making someone happy rather than like forcing myself to like churn out videos, which I feel like True. can easily happen to TikTok creators. Yeah. And I feel like it happens to anybody in this space, like whether they're on YouTube or Instagram, like the burnout can happen. Um, mm -hmm. And it's nice that like this stuff is quick, like snackable content that is decently easy to make. So you can produce a lot of them, but it does, even if they're easy to make, like just like you have to spend a lot of time to be looking at the trends, knowing what's exactly going on, like what the hashtags are. So like it can feel that way. And like sometimes I'll batch content. So if I have a day where I don't want to do something or I don't want to get on or I want to unplug, I can still post and not be on. 
Right. But that's kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have some drafts like there to put out if you want, but. Exactly. It's, it's hard. The burnout is definitely hard. Um, and I, yeah, I've started to feel, feel the burnout. So, um, wanting to get back into it though, of course, but it ebbs and flows. Yeah, I totally get that. Some days I feel super creative and I like will churn out like six videos and then I'll either post like two or three that day and then I'll have another day's worth to post. And sometimes I just feel like I don't want to post anything and I feel just like, ugh. And then when I try to make videos, they're ugh, like they just suck. (laughs) <laughs> so it doesn't even matter. I totally get that. Yeah. yeah. So on this common thread here, what do you kind of feel like when somebody that's not on TikTok in like your real life, like finds your TikTok or like knows that you post it? Like, do you feel that <laughs> sense of like embarrassment that you're on TikTok still? Because like, I feel like a lot of creators will be like, oh, well, like, you know, I just make videos. It's not that big of a deal. Like nobody else knows in my life. So like, there's like all this embarrassment that's still surrounding TikTok, even though like everybody's and their mom is on it. But Mm -hmm. like when people make, are making videos in like in real life, people are kind of like still judgy about it if they're not on the app. Mm. Um, I haven't necessarily run into like the judgmental people. Uh, but when I first started making videos, I made some of them at work, like, uh, that one that went viral, I made that at work, okay. and I was excited, I'm really close with my boss, and, um, I'm currently furloughed, but we still, like, call each other in text, and I showed her, and it was hilarious, because I kept going, like, I have 100,000 views since yesterday, and she'd be like, oh, oh my god, um, <laughs> but then she recently told me, I've been following you on TikTok, and I'm like, mm please, please don't watch. I don't even show my parents all my videos. Like, yeah. I'm like, please, please don't watch my, my minor thirst traps. Please, please don't do that. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the one way where I'm like embarrassed. Um, yeah. first, she's like almost like a second mother. She's so sweet and so kind, but, um, yeah, but I've also had it. So I'm single and, uh, I've been on the apps. Uh, for the past couple months and now it's a thing for people I match with to message me that they recognize me but they don't know how oh my god and then about two days later they'll text me like oh, I saw you on TikTok you were on my for you page and granted I have control of the videos I put out you know I know when I'm roasting myself or not um but sometimes I get worried and I'm like what but which video was it? Because some of mine are all like, hmm, I'm cute. And yeah. other ones, I'm being very weird. Uh, so that's my concern there. Granted, they're still talking to me at that point. So they must <laughs> like it. Uh, but <laughs> must be working I for do, you. I do get quite nervous when they send that. Uh, but I mean... It's fine, I guess. And I've had a couple friends. <laughs> I've had a couple friends text me uh, and be like, "I saw you on TikTok," but apparently it's because they send, they like flood the people who are in your contacts your videos. I guess. Oh, I've I didn't heard, know that. I heard recently if you have okay. people in your contacts and they download TikTok, sometimes they'll yeah, watch out. Sometimes they'll send them your videos to the top of their free for you page. Interesting. The algorithm goes hard. I know that, like, because my mom has a TikTok, and she, her TikTok is, like, hilarious. Does she make videos? No, she just watches them, but she's, like, she, (laughs) she's very productive driven, so all of the stuff is, like, learning sign language, like, Christian sermon stuff, and, like, literally all of the shit that she wants to learn, like, baking stuff. She has, like, a whole Asian cuisine thing because she's never been good at it, and she wants to be better at it, so it's all just, like, things that she just wants to learn and be better at, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, woman, like. (laughs) I mean, it's a, it's a good quarantine tool, you know? True. Very true. That, that but she sees gay stuff. My sister sees gay stuff. Like my cousins, and my roommates will all be like, God, like, I think I'm on gay TikTok because of you, because I followed you. And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. It's the best. Have you run into people judging you for making TikToks? You mentioned it a little bit earlier, just like yeah. how people. Yeah, like, I don't know. When I first started, like, you know, I had just family just, like, busting my balls for it, and I was like, yeah, you wait, you fucking wait, and, um, 
but once I kind of started going by, they're like, oh my God, like, this is, this is so cool. They're not like a, oh my God, you can make something of this. They're just like, wow, that's really neat. Like, that's super cool. <laughs> um, like a little, a- they're supportive. It's like a kind of patronizing, but also like, they don't really know. Like, and I'm like, yeah, like I had a hundred thousand views. They're like, good, good job. Good job. Like they're not 20- in it. to like, no, what's how yeah. big. It yeah. Um, and I told my grandpa, I was like, dude, like you have like a million views. She goes, sweet. Is it the fishing one? <laughs> like they want to see us that. go fishing? <laughs> you could do a part two. Do a cute little like uh, thing with your grandpa, like tutorial of how to fish. Let me, or something with, do you, yeah, I try, you should just put him in everything. Clearly he, he gets the views. He's so cute. Okay, guys, so this is the questions for the queer segment time. So if you guys um, don't already know, it's part of the podcast where we try to answer your questions on life, love, happiness, et cetera, that, you know, we probably have no business trying to answer. Um, So if you'd like to submit a question that could be chosen for this podcast, please send them with your name, age, and where you're at in the world to questions at queertalkpodcast.com. And if you want to stay anonymous, please let me know when you submit so I can keep your identity private. Um, But this question is coming from Nicole. Uh, She's 26 and she lives in Long Island. So June marks one year that I decided the biggest secret of my life was done weighing me down. I decided I was ready to come out to my sister, my best friend, and my grandparents. Much to my surprise, half of my friends and family replied back with, it's about time you figured it out. I consider myself beyond lucky as there are millions of LGBTQ plus individuals who don't have open-minded slash loving friends, family, or support. However, there are people within my family that question my sexuality because it has taken so long for me to come out. My biggest concern when first coming out was being invalidated. I've been called a fake gay and more recently have been told, I don't think you're gay. I think you're masking an even bigger issue here, your mental health. I've been in recovery from an eating disorder for 11 years now, suffering from depression, OCD, and body dysmorphia. The last few months during this quarantine has definitely caused me to struggle more. All throughout middle school, I knew I was different, but did not know how. I was bullied for how I dressed because I didn't feel comfortable in what everyone else was wearing. It led to an eating disorder and depression. Um, Also, boyfriends came and went, but for some reason, mine seemed to be going quicker than others. When it got to the point in the timeline where intimacy was on the table, I ditch. I didn't lose my virginity until after college uh, at 23, so my serious, to my serious boyfriend at the time. Since then, I've had two serious relationships, both with uh, men. I always thought there was something wrong with me, like I was broken. Um, it was normal for sex to feel like a chore and that faking pleasure was what everyone did. I recognize that my brain definitely plays a huge role in my self-worth and validity, but I do believe so much of this pressure regarding coming out and LGBTQ um, is from society's labels and the timeline we are supposed to follow. Because I did come out late, I must be faking because of my eating disorder. I must be using this label as a mask to cover what I'm really going through. My question to you guys is, how can I explain to people that while my sexuality and mental health are linked, my mental health is not a mask for my sexuality? Also, how can I overcome these feelings of feeling broken from not feeling enough in the relationships I've had in the past? Also, I know and rationally tell myself that this is all a load of bull, but it's practicing it in my everyday life that I have a hard time doing or knowing where to start to get my mind to actually believe it. Nicole, God, my heart goes out to you. I definitely had had struggles with feeling a lot of those things in my coming out journey. Um, Starting with just feeling invalidated, your family members not being able to validate your sexuality and have that be separate from also validating your mental health. And while those two are linked, it doesn't mean that you are masking your sexuality with your mental health or the reverse. I think it's hard because a lot of mental health issues can stem from being so repressed in who you are and it can cause so many things. Um, However, it can also be really clouded and you might kind of feel clouded because you might have some other traumas 
that also have resulted in some other mental health issues that are kind of all in the mix, um, which is a really long process to unpack those things and figure out how they impact you and how they're impacting other people and yourself and how you interact and things like that. Um, I want to say I came out really as an, like, an old gay, I guess you could say. I was 21 as well. I was a junior in college and I, it was a long process, but I came out to myself and then I just kind of like let it sit. I kind of simmered on it. I didn't do anything about it for two years. I just came out to myself and then at 23 started actually the process of coming out to friends and family and dating. Um, and I also like lost my virginity at an older age and I was 23 and I definitely felt all of those things because like junior high like in high school I was kind of on the same track that everybody else was I just didn't have penis vagina sex because that I think that was just like and I always had so many excuses for it it at first it was a Christian upbringing. So I was like, I'm waiting until marriage. And then when I was like, ah, oh, I'm not super religious, but I wanted to lose it to somebody that I'm in love with. And, and I had a boyfriend that I thought I was in love with, but he had a Christian upbringing. So that didn't happen. And then it got to the point where I was like, you know what, maybe I'll just do it with a, a close guy friend because like who I feel comfortable with and like, I'm at least slightly attracted to like, maybe that'll fucking work and didn't happen and I literally lost it to a guy when I was living in Thailand that I had met there because I was just like I'm gonna fucking get it over with because I've waited this goddamn long and it like hasn't worked out and it was terrible it was stupid it was the dumbest thing ever and I invalidated a lot of sexual experiences that I had had that didn't involve those things with men before that, that I actually like really enjoyed because it wasn't penis vagina sex. It wasn't the intercourse. And I felt like if I had talked to my friends and family about, or not family, but like my friends about it, they would have invalidated me and been like, well, you know, you've never really had actual sex and all of that stuff. And it, it made me feel broken that I wasn't most of the time into a lot of the guys that I dated. I saw other people that seemed really into it and I thought something was wrong with me. And I also thought something was wrong with me when I finally did it, even though I didn't want to do it. And I was already like knew that I was gay. And somehow I was still trying to do all of this compulsory heterosexuality stuff, like just as like to make sure that, that I was. So I had to like go through the whole thing and, uh, yeah, so I definitely understand where you're coming from because that stuff is real. Well, do you have mm -hmm. any uh, stuff to say about that, Ellie? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my heart goes out to you too, Nicole. That's a lot. I mean, coming out alone and figuring out your queerness, e even that is just a lot on top of other things. Um, I think it's hard to like if we're it's hard to when people also kind of in, invalidate your coming out by saying you know you mentioned they said it's about time you figured it out uh, it, I mean had they uh, but it takes time for you I yeah I came out later I came out as bi um, I did that trajectory um, and I too had to come up to myself first and then sprinkle in friends and I, it took me a long time to come out to my family. Um, I too was raised in a Christian family, granted a very like liberal Christian family, um, but it still was, was hard. I'm so sorry that you've been called a fake gay. Being gay is hard. Um, I think sometimes to adults they can think as though it's like a trend like everyone's doing it it's something exciting to be a part of but when it comes down to it um, being gay can make your life harder so it's not necessarily something one would choose for themselves especially if they have had a harder life um, 
so I'm so sorry that they've, they've tied that to your mental health. And I agree that a lot of mental health issues can come from, it comes from how you were raised and repressing those things. When it comes to having boyfriends and not, uh, you know, enjoying the intimacy and ditching out on it, that's normal. I think for me, when I was figuring it out, like the quote I will have on my tooth, well, no, no. The quote I won't have a stone. <laughs> that's a lie. But like the quote that I work with saying, all my friends are me to say this when they ask about like me coming out, and they're like, "You dated men before." A mouth is a mouth when your eyes are closed. Okay, certain things are meant to feel good and fine and be enjoyable and be fun. If you're both consenting, it's 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 gonna be a nice time. But obviously, things feel better and deeper when you have that emotional connection with someone, that deeper love with them. For me, the first time I slept with a woman, it was like an aha moment. My whole body, I became super anxious. Uh, that doesn't make sense, but I did. And I remember she had fallen asleep and I was looking at her and I was like, someone pinch me. I think I'm asleep. I think I'm like dreaming this. This feels so right though. Um, because I have been in love with a couple men. I've had a lot of relationships with men. Um, and while certain things felt good, it, it, it doesn't beat how much better things for me feel with a woman. And mm -hmm. you, I think it's also sad that as a society and people in general are quick to tell a lesbian woman or a lesbian in general, you know, how do you know you haven't been with a man? Because there are, you know, gold star lesbians. Yeah. But you don't have to be with them to know. And for some of us, it takes some trial and error to know. And that's okay, yeah. too. Um, and it's, it's, it's good that, you know, you've, you've taken the time to try at least to them, to your family, because it seems as though if you had it, then they might oppositely be saying, well, you haven't tried it to know. Yeah. And I think that it's in itself, it's, it's like either way you go, they're gonna, they're gonna question how valid you are. But yeah, Nicole, I just want to let you know, like you're valid if you've never slept with a woman before, you're valid if you have, you're valid if you change your mind. People change their mind. People change their mind about their labels when they're trying to find their way, you know? Um, and you're valid either way. I think for my family, what helped them, because my coming out process, when I came out, it went kind of badly. And then it's been slowly getting better, um, at least as far as my parents go. Um, so for them, I knew this all along, but I have now seen it to be true since coming out and dating women that having them see me with a woman having to physically see me dating and being in love with a woman and holding her hand and kissing her that that has really helped them navigate that this is real this is happening that shouldn't be the case and maybe that won't be the case but as time goes on they'll get more used to the idea as you keep speaking on it and than going about your dating life, like it will get better. Um, the other day, my mom, I was showing her some of my TikToks for the first time and she asked me like, Femme, okay, so what are the different things? And I was like, well, there's a chapstick lesbian, <laughs> there's a lipstick lesbian. And immediately she turns to me and goes, oh, that one's you. And <laughs> that was the first time that my mom has ever validated the fact that I call myself a lesbian. That is, that's it. Because up until this time, I went through a breakup four months ago, my mom immediately was like, well, I hope I, you, that you'll keep your mind open to men, maybe. And I, Aww. They're in Northern Florida. Okay. That you'll keep your, a ni like, uh, your mind open to like a nice Southern man. Uh-uh. And, like, and I was like, they're a nice Southern women. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, it just takes, as far as family goes, I think in a lot of ways, it just takes time. It just takes time for them to get used to it, to digest it, mm -hmm. to see it or not. Yeah. It just, it just takes, it just takes time.
it really does get better. I know it's a cliche term, but it truly, truly does. Yeah. Um, and in reference to you talking about this timeline and um, the pressure regarding coming out and um, you know, society putting labels on you and this timeline that you're supposed to follow, I felt the same way because I came out and I felt like I had missed out. I felt like I had went through the motions and I was doing what other people were doing in junior high and in high school. And, but I wasn't really, I didn't have the rich experiences that everyone else did, but I didn't know that at the time that, that I know it now. And, and I thought, oh man, like I missed like coming out after high school and getting to experience being out in college where you're with literally thousands of people in your age group that are wanting to experiment and they're figuring themselves out too. And I felt like I completely missed out on that. And it's taken a long time and I'm still trying to get through the fact that I feel like I had missed out because now I'm, you know, I came out when I was 23 and then I had a year and a half relationship. And so that ended five months ago and then quarantine hit. So it's been really, really, it's been tough. It's been tough um, to, you know, be dating in those circumstances and to not have that huge cohort of people that makes it a little bit easier. Um, there's been a lot of obstacles, but I wouldn't regret it because like I'm, I'm now trying to get out of regretting it because I would not have gotten on TikTok if, cause I would have been in a completely different place in my life. If this had happened four years prior, I wouldn't have gotten on TikTok. I wouldn't have been enthralled into the, the TikTok scene. I probably wouldn't have made videos and I probably wouldn't have this podcast. So I feel like things are supposed to happen the way that they are. And this was something that my mom had told me when I was telling her about this. And she goes, this is your, this is your plan. Like, this is what was supposed to happen, regardless of how you feel about it. Like that you needed that time. And here we are, like, what are you going to do with it? So like, my question to you is like, you know what, like you're here, you're going through this, like many of us, you know, what are you going to do with it? And for me, it was giving back and doing this podcast and hopefully people who are in their, you know, mid twenties and who are in the same space as us can be like, oh, wow, I'm not the only one. I don't have to feel embarrassed anymore about, you know, not losing my virginity until I was 23 and all of the stuff surrounding what sex is and what sex is not and like all of that dumb shit. And, you know, be, being okay with the fact that, you know, you had gone through the motions and you hadn't really experienced it. So now you're doing it a little bit later and that's okay. Like I had to experience a lot of that stuff a little bit later because I was repressed and it's okay. And it, mm -hmm. you got to take it back. And it, if you take it back, it doesn't make, it makes it smaller. If you can make light of it, you know, make fun of it. Like I've, I haven't made fun of it on TikTok videos, but I probably will at some point. Um, if you can make light of it, then you can conquer it. Yeah, I definitely, I've definitely thought about that too. How I get, I get a little jealous sometimes of the youngins on TikTok because I, I wish I had had that growing up. I think a part of the reason why it took me so long to figure it out was because I didn't have an example in front of me. All, all, all we had was Ellen and Ellen is not my type. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's cute, but she's not for me. Um, but I, yeah, I was thinking about that today, like, uh, the Avery Cyruses and all those like 19 year olds, mm -hmm. they're, they're very lucky, but I mean, there's something to be said for, you know, social norms. Um, because like, I think a lot of us who came out later, um, it's, it's what was happening around you in high school. I think to me, I thought when I was young that I was only pretty if guys thought I was pretty and that mm -hmm. really defined me for a lot of years and, um, for far too long until the end of college when it was more like what I think of myself is important. And also like what women think of me is important, but like, it's fine. Um, <laughs> But, but at the same time, yeah, I think if I had come out or figured out my sexuality earlier, my coming out experience as far as my life as a whole goes wouldn't have been as easy because in college I went to a liberal arts school. I studied theater. Everyone around me was queer and very accepting. So everyone around me accepted me. It was only my 
my family that took a moment. Um, so if I had figured out in high school and dove into all of that, I could have had a much different time. So I, I, I get why it's easy to kind of mourn the loss of that, of those teenage years, really dating the people you know you would have been into. But at the same time, figuring out as an adult, we have so much more at our disposal to, uh, to like make us more comfortable and it makes it almost easier sometimes, not always, but for me at least. The kids of today are lucky. Gen Z's. They these, they're lucky they have all these you TikTok lesbians. You know how to work every single piece of technology. Y'all can be whatever you want with whatever hair color you want. <laughs> I could never have done that. <laughs> it's good that we're evolving through generations, though, you know? Like, even though yes. we didn't get to, it's good to see it. Because think about, like, all of the work that all of the, you know, queer people have put in over the years for us to get here specifically queer people and people of color mm -hmm. have literally fought and they've been, they've died, they've been murdered. Like there's been so much that has happened for us to get here. Like yeah. appreciate where you're at, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it could have been a lot worse. Yes. Without them, without, you know, it's, it's pride month without what happened with the Stonewall riots, without all of those people, this would not be possible. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, these, out and proud queer TikTok creators could could very well not be possible for you know it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for what happened and the people that like honestly they've laid down their lives to let us have an out and proud future mm -hmm. and we are all forever you know indebted to them but yeah nicole i totally get and I'm going to go back to the invalidation part because when I first started coming out and I no longer was looking at men and I didn't see them and I wanted women to see me, but I was still in that like weird space. So like in terms of presentation, like I definitely was more, not that I'm, my style has changed dramatically, but I definitely have gone back to my roots of being a tomboy kind of STEM area. And I, had some changes and I and I definitely know them now but I would when I would do that I wasn't getting any attention at all so like it, it was hard because it's not like I wanted attention from men but I wasn't getting attention from women either and so I was like mm, like uh, like what do I do with that and so sometimes I would dress in ways that would would garner that but I didn't want to dress that way so I feel like I was kind of the opposite of you Haley like I I didn't want to dress girly, but I kind of felt, I just like was in this weird space of like, oh, well, like, I don't feel like attractive enough to the people who are giving me attention. And mm -hmm. to, like just the women that I've, you know, my friends and things like that. And so it was a challenge for me to get back to those roots of just my tomboy self and like sometimes being girly. Uh, but most of the time just like being myself and Cause I, I don't, you know, typically wear makeup. So I use makeup like when it's like fun and I'm going out and stuff like that. But like my presentation changed just a little bit and it made me, it feels so much better. And now that like I'm in that space where, you know, I, I'm confident in what I'm wearing. Like, it's not like I'm wearing things to get attention. That was something I had to deal with as well, but like just being comfortable in your own skin and wearing stuff, not for other people um you know like in college I remember wanting to wear literally like my Birkenstocks and I wanted to wear these tom girl jeans and just something that wasn't even like super masculine but it was masculine enough for me because I was afraid that people I would wasn't going to get the attention I wanted and I, I wasn't going to be as pretty as some of the other girls there and like I just I don't know and I like would do that and I look back like what the fuck was I doing like what it's, was it's I the doing? queer struggle it yeah. is it's it's everybody okay everybody loves attention I mean people people like attention it's one of the things that's very human I I it's so interesting to like just hear the way that it worked out for you um I I think back to like the times though when I I tried to dress a little more masculine and it went back to that thing of Am I attracted to this? Yeah. And I want to date it or do yeah. I want to look like this? Yes. And it's it's that whole thing. But like 
as an opposite viewpoint, dressing femme, I, I, it is kind of annoying sometimes to, we hear this a lot, but as a femme, it's annoying for people to not, to also not be seen. And that's also too, I don't, I don't know how you present Nicole, but, um, however you choose to present is valid and Mm -hmm. people will know you're gay if they get to know you or if by, if you're shouting it from your rooftops, but, um, it is hard though. I mean, like, it's, it's always flattering to get attention, even from people you're not attracted mm-hmm. to. But that's the same for if a girl hits on you and you're not actually, like, that into her. It's flattering, yeah. but, but uh, I, you know, you're just not into them. I've found even in queer spaces not feeling valid, even though I am queer, like, I belong there. Um, but visibly, I'll feel sometimes like I'm not a part of this group. I, I went through kind of this phase of dressing more mask when I would go to gay bars because I wanted, when I was single, because I wanted people to know that I was gay. I wanted girls to hit on me, but it it didn't feel right. But every time I dressed like myself, them, you know, they'd be like, oh, where the, are you looking for that bachelorette party or your gay best friend? And I'm like, that is not a good term to use. Also like, no, I am my own gay best friend. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for just my friends. I went through this time as well when I started dating girls because I predominantly um, am attracted to anywhere from like chapsticky to more mask. I'm I'm girly enough for everyone, and so I'm normally <laughs> not as attracted to femmes, but I've I've dated across the spectrum. Um, but I found that I started. I subconsciously did this and I realized this right after my last breakup that I was letting my relationships with women validate my queerness and I wasn't doing the work myself to just feel valid. I, I very much liked going to out in queer spaces with them because then therefore I was being seen as a part of the group by being on their arm, by holding their hand, by kissing them. I was a part of it by being adjacent from another queer being rather than just feeling valid in myself. And it wasn't until after, yeah, this past relationship I had that I realized I still was feeling like that. Um, And I think that's something that I'll struggle with for a bit, you know, also just as a femme, I think that takes some time. For those of you who don't know, I literally slid into Haley's DMs. (laughs) I was gonna say that. (laughs) I did. You did slide in my DMs. I did. I did at the beginning of my gay TikTok journey because you were the first one that showed up. And I, I don't really... S- no, I slide it. Well, this is the thing. I don't... I haven't slid, slid into many people's DMs. I've only done it like five times where I've initiated it. Um, and that was just at the beginning when everything was like super new. Um, you're you the did. only one that I've kept in contact with. <laughs> we were fun. I, better. I was like... But, okay, so like people, people do s- a slide. They they slip and they slide in there, and um, <laughs> sorry, I'm weird. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. Um, but they, yeah. So like, I don't know. You were, I don't even remember what you said, but I was like, oh, she seems cool and uh, nice. And uh, no, but I was gonna mention that. I was like, do we need to tell them? You that? should have. Because I was going to. I was going to. I was like, I literally, I slid in your DMs and I said, if you don't like deep dish, we can't be friends. <laughs> I will tell you, I did, I did lie a little bit. I, I mean, I'm okay with deep dish. I just thought it was something to connect with you with <laughs> on uh, Chicago. Um, and then you asked me what place I liked and I literally texted my cousin and I was like, what place did we go to when we were up there? <laughs> I need to know. Hey, but I like, I like getting to know people. I think. Me too. I saw this, someone on TikTok talking about, you know, well, for one thing, have you noticed that it's like TikTok cuffing season right now? Like everyone's pairing up. I've noticed that. Um, Who is pairing up? I know Sophie and Avery. And then there's um, Olivia and that blonde. Okay. They're all like 19, so they don't affect my life. Um, And then the girl from Outer Banks and another famous TikTok lesbian. Oh, cool. And then I've just seen it happening. And I'm like, it's fine. They're 12. Um, <laughs> but 
just kidding. Don't come for me. <laughs> <laughs> Their stands are going to fight me in my comments. Um, Is 19 too young for you? What's too young for you? Yes. Do you have to be oh. 21? Honestly, my cutoff is I'm like 23. I think okay. I've always dated older. Um, I like more mature people. And I think too, I'm now at the age where I'm so far beyond college that it really doesn't impact mm -hmm. my life. Where, you know, when I was right out of college, it was like, where'd you go? What is your major? And I granted, I still am curious in that. Um, but I, fi I, I figured out life now, and I've, like, talked with some 22 and 23-year-olds in the city, even some people at, like, 21, because that would be a definite cutoff. Um, but they're still, like, let's go dance at Scarlet, and I'll be, and I'm, like, okay, no, like, let's go to a cocktail lounge, let's chat, let's have some, like, really good hors d'oeuvres, <laughs> let's talk about life, I love a charcuterie board talk to me about your exes. <laughs> talk to <laughs> oh, talk to me about your exes over cheese and aged meats. Please. So guys, uh, if you are loving this episode, getting value out of it, pre please drop us a review on iTunes. This helps us get discovered by more queer listeners just like you so we can get this in the ears of people who are looking for some cool, relatable, gay content. So do you have any advice for all of the femme lesbians out there? Any advice for kind of overcoming those challenges or like getting women to see you? Like, are there anything that you, anything that you've done or had experience with, like where you can say certain things like, I don't know, like, do you listen to Girl in Red? Or like, do you, like, I like your style. Like, what are some things that yeah. you're like signaling? You're like, hey, bitch. I, I'm a bad lesbian. I did not listen to Girl in Red until I, till, until I found TikTok. I Me did too. Not. Me too. Okay. I was like, I'm from a Tegan and Sarah era. Mm -hmm. um, but, ooh, so, I think for me, it took a little bit of time, one, to become more comfortable with myself, um, but going out, like, to have the women I wanted to see me see me, I think it's it's pushed me to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, granted, like, I naturally have an aggressive, I'm loud and I'm outgoing, um, but when it comes to meeting people and in those social situations, I do get a little shy. So it's really pushed me to have to go up and talk to someone, even though I'm really scared to, or go make the first move. Um, because honestly, I do not get hit on in gay bars. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> so I don't know. what they. I'm, maybe I'm just not people's type who are single there or it's because they think I'm straight or I'm like some curious girl who's just gonna like be a heartache or whatever but it's it's forced me to have to to make the move I don't have a set question but I think when I've met people not like out socially at night I've brought up like oh my ex-girlfriend or oh oh yeah I once dated a girl who lived there or I think just connecting it back to that, mm -hmm. which then, uh, is that problematic? I don't know, uh, bringing up exes when you first meet someone, but <laughs> I guess I bring up exes. I should rethink that. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, so, I mean, we're recording this third episode. This is the first time anyone's brought up exes. <laughs> like the other I, two, like, that, didn't. <laughs> I don't I find it bad. I guess. I think it's the way in which you talk about them. Like, if if you're, like, on a date with somebody and they're, like, or you're just hanging out with somebody, right? Right. In the queer space, and they're, like, yes. oh, my ex Max was a fucking bitch, piece of shit. Like, if they're just, like, Brutal. constantly degrading their ex, like, it's, it's a red difference. flag. I think, for me, I'm happy to say that I do not meet the lesbian trope of not being over my exes. I feel very much over my exes. And so I Good. think that... I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm able to talk about it and I think it, it's, it's just informative if you can speak about it from a healthy viewpoint. Yes, I agree. And it, and you can say like how you've evolved from it and what you've learned and you know, like dating is literally practice for whatever you're, if you're going for marriage or you're going for companionship or whatever you're looking for, like it's, for that, to figure out what you like, what you don't like, what you can tolerate, what you can't mm -hmm. tolerate, your boundaries, if you have any, do you want serial monogamy, do you want non-monogamy, like, 
you have to figure this stuff out. And these people are teachers. If they're not going to be the life partner, or whatever goal you have, like they're going to be teachers. So like, what have you learned mm -hmm. from it? What, you know, hopefully they've learned something from it. You've learned something from it about yourself, about who you want as a counterpart. Like it's all about the learning. It's all about the experience. Exactly. I think whenever you go through a breakup too, you kind of come back to like this list of things you want in another person and then you like add a couple more things mm -hmm. you know yeah. especially with what's going on right now my roommate yeah. and I, my roommate and I have both been like FaceTime dating people Ooh. and we'll hear from I mean still single yeah <laughs> um but <laughs> good to know <laughs> good to know <laughs> I should not just like in there ways <laughs> have I mentioned that too many times anyways uh so but it's funny to hear people mention going out because it immediately informs me to how, who they are during this time. I've been, I was talking, you know, to someone and then they didn't understand, they didn't agree that they had white privilege and they were white. Oh, so God. I had to take the time. I, I wanted to take the time to explain, yes, you do, um, because you are white. And I think too, so if anything, that's added on even more things now and I've seen it on tinder well people people will put you know like a cab good hashtag black lives matter different things about different um like staying quarantined during this time just to kind of weed out the people that don't agree because I think at being a queer person I guess sometimes I assume that because we're kind of a a, a group of really accepting people of kind of like people from the outskirts of society that will be much more accepting and understanding mm -hmm. of other situations. But sometimes that's, that's not the case. Um, people, there's still like prejudice and so many different mm -hmm. things like biphobia that even just yep. like as a group of queers, like queer yeah. community alone deals with. And I think so, yeah, but it's been interesting to see people and to, to have to navigate that it's just another thing to add to that to that long list of your ideal person that may yep. may, may or may not exist yes. as white people i i deeply feel that we we do have to be the ones to educate ourselves and educate those around us in the past we as white people have let these conversations be silenced or subside with past like black lives matter issues mm -hmm. um and we can't this time and we we have to be the ones to to keep it going and to keep it you know keep ourselves educating ourselves as well as each other i always have to ask myself when i post content is it from like this white savior complex which i think is kind mm -hmm. of the trendy stuff like i i had a couple ideas of wanting because there was this um this person of color and she it looked like she was doing something for a duet because she was like looking this way and i thought oh, like I should do a duet with her. And then I thought, is this like, I just felt a little white savory. It didn't feel like completely good because it, it felt like I was going to gain something from it. So I feel like if I was going to gain something from it, it's not something that I should be posting. You know, like there's that whole idea of like, the first idea doesn't belong to you. It was society, but the second idea, like mm -hmm. thing you think is. And I think when it comes down to those things, it goes back to even that whole hashtag of amplifying black voices. It then takes thinking, am I amplifying or am I speaking over? How is the Chicago queer scene? Like what's going on in <laughs> Chicago? It's the big, it's the biggest city in the Midwest. It's, I bet it's 10 times better than anything in Cincinnati, even in Columbus. Like <laughs> what, what's it like? Tell us all. Oh gosh. Okay. So I actually had my three year Chicago anniversary a couple days ago. That's amazing. Um, thanks. So I've lived there three years now. I'm not going to say I know everything about Chicago because I really don't. Um, but I lived in Boys Town for about the first year and a half. And um, <laughs> depending on the state of the world, I don't live in Boys Town now, but in the fall, I'll be moving back to Boys Town. Um, it's a fun scene. It's definitely, it's Boys Town. So it's a lot of mm -hmm. gay men. Um, as far as bars go, um, there's a lot of fun places. I mean, Roscoe's is famous. It's where a lot of cool drag shows are, Berlin awesome. as well. Um, my favorite places are Progress and Diaz Tequila. 
Okay. Um, Dia's tequila, oh my God, is one, I like tequila. And two, it's a restaurant by, ne- by day, club by night. Um, and on Saturday nights, it is like mainly queer women. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, when I first moved to the city, yeah, I was living like five blocks away from the strip of gay bars and um my roommate at the time was lesbian and we didn't know where to go out and we were finally both single and I remember like we're like what's Dia's tequila okay like we'll go we walk in and it was like heaven it was like all women as far as the eye could see and we were like we found it and like from then on granted it was only on Saturdays but we went we went quite a lot um but I think more and more um because I work in theater, there are a lot of really cool queer theater spaces. Um, there's a Pride Art Center where they put on like all different kinds of shows, different queer shows. Um, like they have like this femme variety show where um, if you identify in any way with like femme or queer women, um, you can be in it or go, or I mean, anyone can go, but like be in it and perform. Um, I was in this past year, a queer one act like play festival um where all of the short uh, like one act plays were rewritten fan fiction of different like tv shows books and movies so i played um ours was i love lucy but where ethel and lucy i was ethel were gay together so oh i think as as far as like the theater and music scene there's also a lot they kind of like meld together the theater art and scene um i mean i wish there were more like queer femme like female uh like women identifying spaces Mm -hmm. and there are there it's more so events though like there's no lesbian bar you know like there would be in like new york maybe but um they're harder to find but people really post about them there's a lot of pop-ups that happen a lot of random festivals there's a um there's always like pride and pride month normally um but always in august there's something called market days where they like it's like a weekend long block party in boys town where like everyone oh, wow. comes out and everyone's like drinking on the streets and eating and wearing rainbow and partying it's like a second pride that happens in august probably won't happen this year but it's definitely it's definitely a fun scene i sometimes wonder what it would be like to be maybe like in West Hollywood or in New York Mm because I do feel like there might be more like lesbian queer identifying spaces um but I feel lucky that like I said before I came out of a time where six months later I moved to a big metropolitan area so holding my girlfriend's hand was never an issue on the street you know I never dealt with like the societal pressures of this city of my city um, Mm -hmm. because it's so metropolitan and yeah I think that definitely like aided my coming out and figuring out faster because I was in queer accepting spaces I posted what's funny is I posted something yesterday that's now kind of taking off where I'm not confident in my body (laughs) Really? I didn't see it. I posted one where I'm like, I like it, but not a lot. I don't like it. I did that it That one, okay. I, I did it to like, I like wearing tank tops, but I don't like the way my arms look in tank tops. So gotcha. I don't like it. Uh, but I mean. I think okay. it's relatable though. Confidence and it, ebbs and flows. It does. And I think body positivity can go either way. Because I think people can get fat shamed and people can get skinny shamed as well. And, yeah, it's and then and then the so skinny shamed people yeah. don't get validated because it's like, well, you're fucking skinny. So like, yeah, I dealt with like a lot of bullying in elementary school, and middle school, um, for my weight. Like I've always been like a thick gal. I have always been curvy and um, yeah, overweight my whole life. Um, but in high school, when I really found like my passion for theater. Um, that gave me a lot of confidence and I was friends with a lot of people that that didn't come up now granted like if you go on my Instagram all of my best friends look like Victoria's Secret models they're all like really tall and skinny beautiful and so a lot of high school for me also like being queer not knowing it I was like they're all getting so much attention and it's because I'm ugly and fat and like of course that's not it like yeah 
I wasn't confident. That was on me, you know, and also like people's opinions don't matter, but it really took college finding my voice. And I actually played a role in, okay, this is very niche. So if anyone listening knows what I'm talking about in the musical fame, there is a character that, um, wants to be a, it's about a school about a high school of the arts she wants to be a dancer but she's overweight and people make fun of her in the musical for being overweight and in the end she realizes she actually should be an actress and wants to be an actress so i got cast in this role in college and i was kind of annoyed because i'd already played tracy turnblad and i was like great another like niche funny overweight character fabulous i don't want to play this yeah. um but it really took that my junior i played it my junior year to kind of make it my own and make it so the whole time people were laughing with me and I was yeah. in control of the jokes even just like as a character like I had to say these lines but I yeah. really worked on how I felt about it and I think honestly since then that's when I've been a lot more confident in my body as well as then finding myself dating people who oh I always liked what I looked like you know I never I'm lucky I've never had like someone I've dated or a partner like comment on my body in any way um, but, you know, I still have my days where yeah. I, I don't want to wear certain stuff or I feel not cute, but, um, mm-hmm. I think too, for me, it took like picking health as a choice, which yeah. I've kind of done for the past year, um, and getting healthier and losing weight and just kind of feeling myself more. And also society now loves thick women. So like fabulous. They finally yes. realized we're great. Yes, we do. So- <laughs> So it took, it took some time too. And I always thought like that, like, I don't know why I had this thought, but like, I always thought that women were concerned about their bodies because they were concerned because of men. And once I like, you know, came out and I started dating women, like queer women still have body image issues. And it blows Mm -hmm. my mind because if you're dating women, women would know what it's like to have that. And, right. and I've, I've had conversations of, with this about, with straight women, with queer women, like everybody. And it, 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 oh shit. Sorry, that's my alarm to post a TikTok. Um, and it, it really, like, I was just like, oh my God, like I thought that was, this was a, me- a male issue because you were afraid of what your, your boyfriend would think about you because of like societal standards and like that he would not like you or, but like mm-hmm. with women, like, why would we care? Like. I would right. care about that. We understand. Society's still at play. <laughs> but it is. And that's the worst part. Like, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if you're a, a queer woman or a queer person or a straight person. Like, those those little things in society will still get you. And, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It is interesting. I mean, I think, too, like, you can see it. I There are a bunch of really cool, like, femme creators and some like curvy femme creators that I love now um because I feel like they're they're not getting seen as much and they're not like the token popular queer on TikTok which is totally fine um you're into what you're into uh but it's been nice to see I like follow a community of just like curvy women and like body positive women and then I also follow like a whole realm of like femme curvy body positive women and it's just it's just nice to see that people are speaking on it making videos about it um yeah it's just been nice to see so Haley do you want to answer some questions really fast sure okay (laughs) Uh uh-huh texting or talking talking dog or cat good cat big spoon or little spoon both are you the gay that squishes the bugs no I'm the one that traps them and then sets them free (laughs) Best movie to watch for a queer person? The Birdcage, <laughs> just because it's topical. Doc Martens or Birkenstocks? These are both. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Best place to get pizza in Chicago? I don't like deep dish. Uh, I don't know. Giordano's? That's my roommate's favorite. Giving presents or getting presents? Giving. First celebrity you ever had a crush on? I loved Shane on Boys Meets, Boy Meets World. <laughs> Haley, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, if you want to check out more about Haley, you can find her on TikTok and Instagram at Haley Presley Miller. And as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please drop us a rating on iTunes. Leave us a little written review. 
uh, that's it for this episode, my queers. Thank you for listening, viewing, subscribing. Uh, be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.